Uh, well, I have a right to bear uh, bear arms or own a gun, but maybe my my dog doesn't have that right. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't know if your dog has the right. I mean, so like, I don't think that he's able. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think that his paw can even pull the triggers. Man, some so. of some of these like Patriot Supply companies, man, I'm sure they're coming up with it right now. You know, get yeah. your dog a gun too. You know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today, I have uh, another special guest with me. I believe this is like his fifth time on the Parker's Pensies podcast, which is a, a big deal. And he's a big deal in his own right. Um, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Mike Humer once again. And this time, we're going to be talking about rights and maybe some duties, but uh, particularly when you be getting into whether or not you have the right to own a gun. I'm really excited about this topic because I've been wanting to talk about uh, ethical theory and metaethics and political theory and that kind of stuff, but I want to do it in like a fun way and in a really intriguing way. Maybe I shouldn't say fun when we're talking about guns is a really serious thing, but uh, I'm going to suck you guys in and teach you guys philosophy, but you don't click on the stuff unless I have some kind of clickbaity thing. So we're going to be talking about guns. We're going to get in deep uh, to whether or not you have a right to bear arms, but we're going to be talking about meta ethics as well. So you're going to need to hear that in order to uh, understand whether you have the right to own, own a gun or not. So by the end of this episode, you're going to be an expert in meta ethics and gun rights. So uh, uh, stay tuned for that. If you like this podcast, if you want to support it, you can click the link to my Patreon in the description, wherever you're getting this podcast at. That's the best way to do it. Uh, you can give, you can support this podcast for like three dollars a month, all the way up to a hundred, whatever, whatever you want. But uh, it all keeps the lights on, so please consider doing so. Without further ado, though, let's bring in Dr. Mike Humer, Galactic Emperor of uh, Philosophy in the Universe, and let's get into rights and guns. Dr. Humer, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Hi, uh, thanks, and thanks for that generous introduction, <laughs> and, and for using my proper title, Galactic Emperor. <laughs> that's right. That's good. Uh, man, th this is uh, this is huge. You, you've been on this podcast, uh, not the most, but almost the most out of any other of my guests. So uh, it's okay. cool. So who who has the record? <laughs> I don't know. They they were record. yeah they were arguing about it. There was a couple guys. Uh, whether they were on solo episodes or guest episodes and stuff. So it might be Taylor Sear uh, over at the uh, Free Will, uh, the Free Will Show podcast. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to have to keep working on it. That's right. Well, you got enough, you got enough uh, expertise in philosophy generally construed to uh, talk about all sorts of stuff. I, I'm really excited to talk about guns. You wrote this uh, piece for your uh, Substack now. Uh, uh yeah it's about the right to to bear arms if we if we have yeah. a right to own a gun uh what what do you do you call that your blog is it your sub stack i, I want to yeah. point people towards fake news it's an amazing name by the way just that alone fake yeah, news yeah. n-o-u-s like mind in greek so yeah yeah, yeah. What, what is that is it your blog yeah that's my blog yeah so it used to be fake news.net but then i moved it to Substack. so now fake news.substack.com okay I think you can still find it at .NET too, right? Uh, yeah, although the new um, uh, the new posts only go up on Substrat oh, gotcha. because okay. I don't feel like you know <laughs> doing it twice. So yeah, um, yeah, and that um, uh, the post I had about gun control is based on a paper that I published like yeah, you know two thousand three, and yeah. you know I've written a couple things since then. But yeah, well. Um... Real quick, just a broad scope here. When we talk about, so we're going to be talking about the right to own a gun or not. When yeah. we talk about rights, uh, what what subdiscipline are we touching or subdisciplines of philosophy? Is it political philosophy, ethics, metaethics, um, all of the above? Is is there one where it really finds its true home or or multiple? Yeah, I mean, it, well, it's a concept in ethics and political philosophy. Um, you know, I think of political philosophy as... Um, it's kind of like a branch of ethics, right? It's like hmm. it's like ethics for um, the state and society, or something like that. Okay. Application of ethical principles to organization of society. So, yeah. Okay. Well, so you, I mean, you have this book, Knowledge, Reality, and Value. It's a great book. Yeah. I recommend oh, uh, all great, the listeners great. grab this book. Let's um, see you prove that you have it. And okay, look. 
Yeah, yeah, that's so good. You pulled that out of your chimney. We both, yeah, we both have. <laughs> uh, so, so do you think is is value like is is there a trichotomy of of philosophical topics and values like the broad category that under which political philosophy and ethics resides? Oh, um, yeah, you could say that. Nice. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, so. I want to, I think we're going to get into some meta ethics stuff too. Um, can you just lay that out for us? Like what, what is, when people talk about meta ethics, what are we talking about? Yeah. I mean, it's, well, it's a branch of philosophy that addresses philosophical questions about the nature of ethics. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, like, I mean, the best way to explain what anything is, is by giving examples. Right. So yeah. we ask things like, uh, are there objective values? Like, you know, not asking specifically what's right and wrong, but just asking whatever you say is right and wrong. Is that an objective fact mm. or is it subjective or are there no such facts at all? Uh, and then, you know, have questions like, how do we know? How do you know what's right and wrong? That's a good meta ethics question. Um, sometimes people ask questions about uh, motivation. What like um, so sort of what reasons do people have for acting morally? What what might motivate them to act morally and what might be a good reason for acting morally? Mm. Stuff like that. Now, uh, the thing that you notice is, so these are all questions about ethics, but they're not directly ethical questions. Yeah. So, uh, and notice that also, like, you know, even if you don't believe there are objective values, there would still be objective facts about metaethics, right? Yeah. Like, it would be an objective fact that there are objective values or that there aren't, you know, which, yeah. whichever answer it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, this is, this might not matter that much, but when I was talking with, uh, with Timothy Williamson about the philosophy of philosophy and I, I heard somewhere that he doesn't like the word meta philosophy because it, like you said, it, it puts to, to, to use the word meta seems like it puts it beyond or above the scope. So if, if you had meta philosophy, somehow it, it wouldn't actually be, uh, a, the subject, uh, uh, rightly described by, or, argued over um by philosophers and that's that's a separate point but when it comes to meta ethics um is that where does that fit does that f it, it it doesn't rightly fit under ethics because it's meta because it's beyond well i mean like as far as i don't know like classifying people you yeah. know classifying people's areas i consider meta ethics as part of ethics okay um yeah you, know, you know like whether that um, whether that's correct and like, you know, the true definition of ethics, I don't know. I don't really care, but yeah. like, you know, like people who, it seems like people who are talking about meta ethics are kind of like, you know, belong in the same group or part of the same yeah. crowd as the people who are talking about ethics. So. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think maybe that, that comes apart when it comes to like logic, because I think if you're, if you're doing like philosophy of logic or meta logic, whatever you call it, you could, you could talk about like the foundations of logic without being like a logical theorist yourself and being particularly mathematically minded or something. Did, what do you, what do you make of that? I mean, I mean, I guess that's true, but there wouldn't be that many people doing that. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. And I, and like a lot of the stuff that's relevant to meta logic requires some pretty, you know, pretty good logical skill, right? Like you have yeah. to think about Gödel's theorem and like, what are the implications of that for the nature of logic? But right. you know, to do that, you have to understand the theorem. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a good point. So, um, when it comes to, uh, rights, what, what are they? What, what is a right? We, we have yeah. this question, do you have a right to own a gun? But before we get to the gun part, I just want to, what is a right? Yeah. I mean, you know, like, uh, when Frege talked about how to define things, um, he had this point that, well, you have to define a sentence that contains the word. You don't have to just define the word by itself. Yeah. And so, because, not all not all nouns actually refer to a thing, mm. right? So my view is there. Well, it's not like there's a thing called a right, but okay. there's discourse in which we say you have a right to X, and I could explain what that means. So yeah, right. So um, it means that there's a kind of moral constraint against interfering with people's having X or something like that. So yeah. having a right to own a gun means there's a moral constraint against forcibly stopping people from owning a gun. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, you know, a couple of things to say about this constraint, like, so it's agent centered. I said, like, and the thing about rights is like, um, you're responsible for ensuring that you yourself don't violate them. 
not for, in general, minimizing the number of rights violations that occur, hmm. meaning that like if you could violate one right and that would somehow prevent someone else from violating two rights, you should typically <laughs> not do so. Yeah. So like if you can murder one innocent person and that prevents someone else from murdering two innocent people, then you don't do it. Yeah. So that's what's meant by agent-centered constraints. Okay. And then the other thing about rights is that, um, in my view, that there are enforceable constraints, meaning that um, it's appropriate to use force to either stop someone from violating it or to in some way remedy a violation. Yeah. Yeah. This gets into something else. I Like who has that right then? Because then we, we talk about like uh, political authority and whether yeah. or not that's even a real thing. Because I know someone has written a lot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can think of some important works on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when I say it's appropriate to use force, you might say appropriate for whom to use force. Yeah. Um, like basically, I would say anyone. <laughs> so, like, if you see a rights violation happening, you can intervene to stop it, right? Although in the real world, this is usually not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, frequently, you don't know what's going on. Yeah. And so, if you try to intervene, you might be making things worse, but. Does okay, it does it matter which right uh, is being what what type of right or whatever is being violated? Like obviously, if someone's getting beat up, it seems like it'd be more there'd be more responsibility to interject than like I don't know something else. If someone's free speech was being violated by you know the microphone being unplugged or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, when I say it's appropriate to use force, um, you know there are constraints on that, so it has to be not disproportionate yeah so yeah if somebody's like um you know stealing a stick of gum from a store you can't shoot them even <laughs> yeah. if that's the only way to stop them from getting yeah. away yeah. and um you know similarly like uh i don't know violation to the right of free speech like if you resort to violence that might be disproportionate disproportionate response yeah um okay um okay a couple more questions about about uh, uh rights here uh are they do you think there are moral properties or are there moral facts like are, are there both or is yeah. the discourse what you brought up about frega is that does that re, like reduce down is it are they reducible to discourse or are there actually like a moral fact or moral property out there in the plato's world well, or something yeah there there's a moral fact right like so there's not an object called a right, but okay. there's a moral fact that we're referring to when we use a statement that contains the word right to such and such. Okay. Right? The fact is, well, it's, it's sort of like a complex pattern of facts about when it would be morally wrong to do certain things. So like okay. you have a right to life is short for, uh, it's morally wrong to kill you, even if doing so somehow prevents someone else from killing two other people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, morally appropriate permissible whatever for people to use force to stop someone from killing you yeah. right? or to remedy the situation if you did kill someone like to get um you know just a just punishment or something okay um and then how about the distinction between uh uh positive and negative rights i think we may have talked about this before but do you, do you like that distinction first of all and then second of all like do you believe that there are positive rights yeah i mean so uh, it's a good distinction, right? So yeah, so a positive right is a right to get benefits from someone else or to get somebody to do something for you. A negative right is a right to not have someone do something bad to you. Yeah. And so when people say that you have a right to health care, health care is a right. Mm -hmm. What they're saying is you have a positive right, i.e. other people have to give you health care. Yeah. As opposed to, I mean, that's what they're actually saying, but, you know, I believe in the negative right to health care, which is <laughs> nobody should forcibly stop you from getting health care, right? Yeah. But I don't believe in the positive right, meaning I don't think that we have, somebody else has to give you health care. Okay. Um, yeah, that's really good. I, I mean, I agree with you. It's, it's, I'm trying to think, uh, I, I need to remember that I have to like give you pushback because I agree with you on so much. I'm like, okay, <laughs> remember to push back on them. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you have to when, defend the positive rights now. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I, I can't think of like, I know the healthcare one, but it's so easily like, it seems so wrong because the, <laughs> because the negative case that you just brought up where it's like, well, now you're forcing a doctor and they have this negative right to not 
yeah. I don't know, freedom of, of association even. Like, why? what if they don't, what if they want to be a jerk and they don't like this people group? Like, yeah, yeah. do you have to force them to do that? No, let them be a jerk and let, you know, let the economy uh, rule them out. Yeah, so. I mean, you know, so like the positive right to healthcare people would say, oh yeah, and so we're not saying that you should force doctors. We're saying that we should, like the government has to pay the doctors enough to make it worth their while to give you healthcare. Yeah. Right. Of course, it does mean that you have to force somebody else to pay. <laughs> so you have to force the taxpayers to pay for somebody's health care. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there might be some. So there are some cases where I would endorse something like a positive right. Um, but, you know, it um, sort of special circumstances, like if somebody is has voluntarily taken a position where they're responsible to provide something for other people, mm -hmm. then the other people might have a right against them. You have a you know a claim that they provide it yeah okay so like um you know like i think the police have an obligation to protect you although the government refuses to recognize this fact so <laughs> it is not legally recognized but i think you have a moral right okay. because it's their job they're taking money from us to do that yeah. and they're forcibly stopping anyone else from doing it and so you know i think it's plausible to say then you have a right to be protected okay yeah based in that situation yeah okay okay that makes sense given not all things are being equal there yeah um i want to talk about like i, I want to go back to the to the grounding of, of moral rights um you've discussed in, in the book and in uh various fake news uh articles ethical naturalism uh can you can you explain like how an et what what ethical naturalism is and how they might look at uh, moral rights Oh, well, I mean, that ethical naturalists in general think that moral properties are somehow reducible to uh, descriptive properties. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, what are descriptive properties? Like, I want to say they're non-moral properties. Yeah. Um, that makes his view sound contradictory. So let me rephrase it so it doesn't sound contradictory. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. so um, you can... Uh, you can pick out the same properties that are used that are picked out using moral concepts, using some non-moral concepts or non-moral vocabulary. Yeah. Okay. So this is not an absurd view. Like, for example, you can explain the nature of color without using color terms. Mm -hmm. Like you could say, well, red is a disposition to reflect wavelengths in this range. And you have to say what the range is. I don't know what it is, though. <laughs> oh, dang it. <laughs> but uh, Okay. But so, and then when I say that thing about the, disposition to reflect wavelengths of light notice how there's no color terms in that description so yeah. okay all right so the ethical naturalists think there's something like that about good bad right and wrong that you could give a description that explains the underlying nature of those things without using moral terms yeah. and so yeah so um you've you've give, you give several arguments can you can you help us out like why why not go in for uh ethical naturalism yeah i mean so to Traditionally, there are two versions of ethical naturalism. There's the analytic version and the synthetic version. So the analytic version is where um, you try to analyze the meanings of moral terms using non-moral terms. Mm -hmm. And so I think that just doesn't work. All right. So like an example is, um, you know, a simple example. Somebody says, you know, I think good just means promotes pleasure. And so, you know, the best thing is the thing that promotes the most pleasure overall. Um, and what's wrong with that? And, you know, like basically GE Moore refuted that. So, yeah. You can was, have was that like there's there's a uh, there's an argument, the Frega and uh, I forgot Frega something problem. Is that Frega, is, Frega and Geech? Yeah, Geech. Yeah, Peter, Geech Peter Geech. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's that is a problem for non cognitivism. The, oh, yeah. I, shoot. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What I had in mind about. Uh, analytic ethical naturalism was um, the so-called open question argument. Okay, um, it's a so it's a little bit weird that it's called the open question argument because G.E. Moore does not, in fact, make a big deal about the notion of an open question. Okay, <laughs> right? but he, I think, I think the phrase "open question" appears once in a long and otherwise repetitive passage. Okay, so anyway, it's something like this. So somebody says, "Yeah, good means promotes pleasure." And then you imagine asking, but is pleasure good? Mm. And you're supposed to see that that's like a meaningful question. And furthermore, that it does not mean, does pleasure promote pleasure? Right. 
And so when you see that it doesn't mean that, then you realize that good does not mean promotes pleasure. Mm -hmm. and, because you can ask that question, they're not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so you could ask the question, does pleasure promote pleasure? But you should just see that that is not the same as the question, is pleasure good? Yeah. And so um, so that's against uh, the, the analytic conception, right? Yeah. And so, I, you know, there's yeah. like, there's supposed to be a similar thing about any other attempted definition of good. Mm -hmm. That there'd be some question that neighborhood that you could ask, you know, is, is such and such good? All right. So somebody says, you know, the good is that which promotes life, you know, like the Randian objectivist view or something. You could say, is life good? Hmm. And you should see that that doesn't mean does life promote life, right? Yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> yeah. So that was like the, you know, analytic naturalism. Uh, I think G.E. Moore basically was, was correct about that. Okay. Um, more recently, most naturalists are uh, synthetic naturalists, meaning they claim uh, you can explain the nature of goodness, but you won't be giving the meaning of the word. And, you know, this is more like um, how you explain the nature of red, right? So when I say the thing about wavelengths of light, that doesn't explain the meaning of the word red. Mm -hmm. So a person can understand the word red without knowing anything about wavelengths of light because they just understand it by seeing things, yeah. seeing red things. So, okay. Um, and um, you can't, I don't, I don't really have a refutation of that view, but I just think there's no reason to believe it. Okay. And so like on the face of it, goodness does not seem to be some, you know, identical to some descriptive properties. Um, and like, I think there's basically no, there's no evidence that it is. Okay. okay. So like what the naturalists are trying to do is like the reason their motivation for saying this is largely to avoid having to appeal to intuitions mm -hmm. like ethical intuitions and so um like they think that if they take this view then they'll be able to give an empirical observation based account of how we have moral knowledge right and so i just think that doesn't work out at all yeah and that leaves you with no reason for being a naturalist Right. So, you know, like, oh, yeah, what's the difference between that story about how redness is a disposition to reflect certain wavelengths of light and the theory that goodness is really the property of promoting pleasure? Um, yeah. So, you know, compare the theory that redness is a disposition to reflect certain wavelengths of light to the mm -hmm. theory that goodness is the property of promoting pleasure or something like that. Yeah. And what's the difference between those two? Well, um, like the theory about redness um we can identify what things are red independently and that's essential to being able to confirm the theory yeah uh, what redness is so okay so can we identify what things are good independently mm. well we can if you believe in ethical intuition and if you don't then we can't yeah right and so like and like there's just not an account of how you would know like what what is the evidence that confirmed what experiment can you do that confirms that goodness is really a property of promoting pleasure? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, well, it seems like they, they could go apart because you, they could come apart in other ways where you could imagine a case where pr promoting the good or seeking the good is not very pleasurable is, you know, it's going again, I guess it would yeah. depend on what you mean by pleasure. Yeah, I mean, like one type of response to the naturalist is to just like take candidates for what goodness might be and give counterexamples to them, right? Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, there's no comprehensive ethical theory that is particularly satisfactory, right? Okay. Like there seem yeah. to be counterexamples to all of them, but. Do you uh, just go with the one that has the least or? Well. Best explanation? I mean, no, basically the world is complicated and <laughs> ethics is complicated. So, yeah. you know, what? I mean, I basically take W.D. Ross's approach, which is there's a there are just several different um, prima facie duties. Okay. Right? I mean, there are several different kinds of things that you ought to do. Other things being equal. Yeah. Like you should keep your promises. You should tell the truth. You should help people who are in need. You should refrain from hurting people. It's a, OK. And these are all just like, you know, independent things that you should do. Other things being equal, meaning if they don't conflict with any of the other things. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes they do come into conflict and then you just have to kind of intuitively weigh which duty you think is more important in the circumstances. 
Um, okay. But basically, it's just, it's just complicated. And then if somebody tries to give a counterexample to this view, I'll just like add another principle to the list. Right? <laughs> yeah. Do they, I mean, that sounds right, but I could see someone being like, well, that's ad hoc. You're just changing it. Like, and do you just own that and like, whatever, this is fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess that's right. I guess it's ad hoc. <laughs> that's good. That's wow. good. We, we, so we talked about analytic, uh, analytic ethical naturalism. And uh, I just wanted to bring up um, continental uh, ethical naturalism. Or, or, no, I'm just kidding. There's no continental. That, that would be terrible. Uh, <laughs> you just talk about uh, Geist and uh, yeah, the sign. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry to, to bog us down there. You, you talked about prima facie um, rights. And in in your uh, in your articles, you talk about this liberty right that we have, and you you argue that it's a, or you state I don't know if you argue or state or whatever, but you say it's a prima facie right instead of an absolute right. Can you flesh that out for us? What's the uh, significant difference? What what what, and and why go in for the prima facie instead of uh, absolute? Yeah, um, and and should we say what the general liberty right was? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, please. Like, basically, you know, right to do what you want. If there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to, right? So yeah. other other thing being equal, you're not interfering with anyone, you're not violating any other rights, then you should be able to do what you want. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, and the reason for believing in that is, well, you know, just like you know, you see somebody on the street is doing some random thing, like you know, they're like painting their hair purple, <laughs> so yeah. like, which there's no reason to do, but they're also not interfering with anyone else. And so then you go out and like threaten them with violence unless they stop painting your hair. <laughs> and, well, that's wrong. You shouldn't yeah. do that. And, you know, we don't want to say, you know, there's like a million billion rights, right? <laughs> you list every innocuous thing that someone could be doing and saying there's a right not to do that, right? So it's better to say, well, there's a general liberty right. Yeah. So, okay. And, and, and yeah. yeah. Now well, I prima facie your... because uh, well, yeah, I, I asked the, you know the distinction between a prima facie and right. an absolute. Like, why would the liberty be prima facie? Uh, yeah, and that I mean it's pretty clear I think because then you just go if you if it was an absolute right to do what you want to do, I guess yeah. even in the liberty right though you kind of do have this uh, all things being equal clause yeah. right so so maybe we could go in for an absolute right there. Yeah, I mean so an absolute right is a right that. Um, may never be violated, no matter what the consequences. Okay. Um, so you can reduce the number of justified violations by defining the right, you know, more carefully, <laughs> like right to do what you want, provided that you're not harming anyone else. So that yeah. you know, makes it so that there's a lot fewer uh, exceptions than you would think. Okay, but there could still be times when there could be times when the person is not harming anyone else, but somehow interfering with them will provide some very large benefit or prevent mm. some very large harm, All right? So, you know, like, so here's a story. So everybody has a um, right to control their own body. Libertarians call this a self-ownership, right? You own your, you own your body. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't like that terminology, but still agree that you have a right to control your body. Okay, so um, imagine that, you know, we discover that there's this one person who uh, somehow their blood contains the cure to cancer mm -hmm. and they refuse to give or sell their blood yeah. um, because they're assholes. <laughs> so yeah. you can, and they, they won't take any amount of money for it because they just want people to die of cancer. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but they didn't cause the cancer, so they're not violating anyone's rights. So yeah. Anyway, could you forcibly take a blood sample from this person in order to find the cure for cancer? Which, by the way, kills hundreds of thousands of Americans every year and millions of people worldwide every year. Right. Um, you go, yeah, you could do that. So that would be a justified rights violation, right? And so that, like, that's illustrating that I don't believe in absolute rights. Oh, okay. So, so you you do think that you do think that we could just forcibly take this person's blood? Yeah. How is there a is there a limit to it? Like, can we take all of their blood? Um. Uh, well, if you're curing cancer, probably yes. <laughs> okay. Like a million, millions of people every year are going to be saved. So yeah, uh, it's probably worth it. It's worth it. Okay. Uh, I, some of the listeners are be like, well, this is just like utilitarianism then. Like how yeah. is, is that, are, are yeah. you a utilitarianist now? No, no. Well, you can't, 
you know, like I was saying earlier, uh, you can't kill an innocent person to save two other people. But you could maybe kill an innocent person to save, like, you know, millions of people. Okay. That's interesting. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. That has uh, theological implications for my Christian audience because we think that one person died to save, yeah, every, yeah, millions. So, yeah, so that was just about, but it was voluntary. So, you know, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, a race violation on his part. Yeah. Okay, it was a good. rights violation on the part of, um, I guess, the, whatever, who, who was it who killed him? Anyway, pilot, the wrong, yeah, Pontius yeah, pilot, yeah, yeah. Um, that was it was a rights violation by him, but not by Jesus, yeah. Um, oh, but yeah, so you know, why should you not be an absolutist? Actually, Christians are much more likely to be absolutists than totally, Christians, but why should you not be an absolutist? I mean, one problem is the problem of risk. So, suppose your view is, yeah, you can never kill an innocent person to produce any amount of benefit or to prevent any amount of harm. Uh, what about taking a non-zero risk of killing an innocent person? Yeah, this is so like the death penalty, right? Like, like uh, a lot of Christians are like super into the death penalty, and you're like, yeah, but what if you kill one? What if one innocent person gets the death penalty? And they're like, yeah, that's kind of the cost of doing business. And you're like, wait a second, that's not. <laughs> yeah, that's a good example, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean that that kind of illustrates the problem, right? You say, but so you know, like one one thing that's. I don't know sometimes said Elizabeth Anscombe said this. Um, it's always wrong to knowingly punish an innocent person. Yeah. Is that or whatever. It's always unjust, which I take it meant that it was wrong. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Well, then we have to shut down the whole justice system, right? Because if we run a justice system, then we know that we're going to be punishing some innocent people. Yeah. So if you're like if you're an absolutist, um, it's like how much risk is acceptable yeah it looks like you have to say zero but then if you say that like then normal life becomes impossible after we shut down the justice system i think you're not going to be allowed to drive a car <laughs> yeah. the you might like run over a kid or whatever right and then i think basically i think you're going to have to like hold your breath until you die yeah it's nice to it's nice to sit in the armchair and be like no i'm an absolute and then you have to go into the real world I wonder just about like, there's like the absolutist way of thinking. It's like black and white and it's like all or nothing. And it's like, well, now it's a slippery slope because you've, if, if you go in just for prima facie, like how much is too much, you know, one killing one person to save millions, that's cool. But how do we get all the way down? Like, what about one person to, you said killing one to save two is no good, but yeah. killing one to save three, like you know, <laughs> yeah. there's now there's like a sororities point or something. Is, is that a yeah, problem or, or no? Uh, I mean, it's an epistemological problem, <laughs> okay. which is to say, oh, well, we don't know what the appropriate cutoff point is. Uh, but, you know, that's. Know is there an objective? Uh, so so is there an objective moral fact of the matter, though? Like, even if it sounds ridiculous, maybe it's like one one to a thousand killing one person yeah. to save a thousand. Like just objectively, even if we can't know it, could that be like an objective moral fact? Uh, yes. Okay. So. I mean, yeah, with, with some caveats. So, you know, like it'll depend on some circumstances, right? Like it yeah. might depend on how old these people are because, oh, yeah. you know, like killing younger people is worse because they lose more life or you know, whatever. It might yeah. depend on other circumstances of the case. But, this is um, why this is why I never got into ethics. Like I'm I'm making myself do it with you here because I, I like this and this is fun. But yeah. It's tricky, man. It's it's really tough. It, it is tricky, right? Yeah. But so, um. But, you know, you might think, oh, wow, you know, like, Kimmer, you don't you don't know where the cutoff point is. Like, I have actually have really not very much idea at all of where the cutoff point is, except I think it's more than two and it's less than a million. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, like, why do you think there is a cutoff point? And like, you know, you have some sort of like arbitrary distinction between a thousand and a thousand and one or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, like the reason why I think there is a cutoff point is, well, because people have very strong intuitions, including me, about certain cases where it, we think that it's wrong. It seems like it's wrong to sacrifice one to save a larger number of people. Yeah. So, you know, like killing the healthy patient to distribute his organs to five other, five organ transplant patients. Yeah. Right, thereby saving five lives. Like almost everyone says that seems wrong. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, except for the utilitarians. <laughs> yeah, the Chinese right? government then, right now. Yeah. Um, but then I take it that I have a just even stronger argument against absolutism. 
which is, okay. you know, once you think about the risk thing and you realize that there are risks all over the place, you realize that absolutism entails that basically you can't do anything. Right. And I think that's just unacceptable. Okay. It can't be that all actions are wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I The problem with ethics is like it actually messes with what you believe and how you act like. Well, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to have to wrestle with this for the rest of my life. You're so. going to, yeah, you're going to have to, you know, deal with some trolley problems. Like, right. When it comes to um, you, uh, when it comes to your view, it um, ethical intuitionism, are uh, you, especially I think in the book, you give just two, you give, uh, you know, ethical naturalism and ethical intuitionism. Is that is that pretty standard? I, again, I don't know the meta ethics uh, literature very much. Are there other uh, non naturalist positions, um, or is it just you know intuition, in, intuitionism or naturalism, and then intuitionism can be broken down into a bunch of others? Yeah, let's see. Wait, where's where's that book? Okay, oh, another book. <laughs> Look, here's a really great book that you could read. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's great. Um, oh, uh, I mean, so. And like maybe the biggest issue in metaethics is about sort of objectivity, the objectivity of ethics, mm -hmm. I guess the most discussed issue. And so there are two views, realism and anti-realism. Right. And so then I say there are two versions of realism, which are naturalism and intuitionism. Okay. Now, uh, in theory, there could be other positions, but I don't know of anyone who has other positions. So, you know, so the naturalists think you can reduce ethical properties to natural properties or just descriptive properties and and they think that you can give an empirical account of moral knowledge yeah and so the intuitionists disagree with both of those they think moral properties are irreducible and um uh, there's an a priori basis for moral knowledge yeah when it comes when it when it comes to the like the yeah the a priori nature of uh moral intuitions or moral knowledge moral knowledge uh do you need the empirical, like when it, uh, people always bring this up to you about disagreement over, uh, over seemings and intuitions. It's like, wow, this guy has this intuition over here. Do we need the empirical component to confirm our ethical intuitions? Like maybe, maybe I'm wrong on a, a couple of different things, but I, I corroborate my intuitions with other people. And, and if most people have a, a different ethical intuition on this, then maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe I should conciliate towards them or something. Yeah, that's right. Well, so yeah, I guess you're thinking of um, other other people's intuitions as empirical. Like, yeah, is it, it's an empirical fact to me that you have a certain right. intuition, right? Right. Um, yeah. Well, um, I mean, if intuition on its own provides some degree of justification, then you can get more justification by uh, comparing your intuitions to other people's intuitions. Oh yeah. And, and if justification comes in degrees, then I could be less justified by learning of moral disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the disagreement will reduce your degree of justification. It might make it so that, uh, you know, like it might even make it so that you're justified in believing the opposite. Like yeah. everybody else, you know, has the opposite intuition you could be justified in thinking that you were wrong. Yeah. Well, I am. Um, why, why doesn't that, so, so maybe I have, maybe I like acquire uh, skepticism about that one moral intuition that like killing babies is, is fun. I have that intuition. Maybe that's a dumb one because <laughs> no one's ever had that one. Right. But, but I, whatever, I have ethical intuition a, and everyone else believes not a, so then I go, oh yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll believe not a like everyone else because I have good reason to, to change my view. Why doesn't that like skepticism about a, why doesn't that spread to the rest of my moral intuitions? I was wrong about this one, which I took to be, you know, basic. Why don't, no. or maybe but it does. I mean, I mean, are the rest of your intuitions cohering with other people's? Oh, so yeah. So that's what I got. That's what I meant by like the empirical, like having to check other people's intuitions. If I, yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe there's no, uh, there's no right action there. Maybe I should just check the rest of mine because one of them was wrong. Yeah. I mean, um, so like I'm trying to think of good examples of this. I mean, there are, there are good examples of um, intuitions being corrected. So like yeah. many people, when they first think about homosexuality, they have a negative reaction to it. Uh -huh. So then they think that it's wrong. And I, I mean, I think probably a lot of people still think that it's wrong. 
Uh-huh. But like, you know, you talk to moral philosophers and it's like basically 0% of them think that it's wrong. Yeah. And then, you know, when you think about that, and then also when you think about what the explanation might be for your negative reaction, um, you know, it's sort of like, well, you're kind of using your emotions to make the moral judgment. And, but if you try to think about why it would be wrong, it's like there is, there's not a very good account. Yeah. Right. And also, it seems like the kind of thing that there should be an explanation of why. Okay. Like, you know, like it, it doesn't seem really basic, like causing harm is wrong. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's why I was hesitant to, to make up my own case, because uh, I listened to a, a podcast that you recently did, and someone brought up like, uh, yeah, I have this seeming about this tree that it was planted in 1964, and you're just like, I've never had a seeming like that ever. <laughs> so I, as soon as you did that, I was like, dang it, I need to be careful about the examples I bring up. Because I think you're right. When when people try to get, come up with these counterexamples to seemings, even like moral seemings, they use crazy ones, and you're like, yeah, but do we have those? Does anyone ever have those? Yeah. yeah, and you know, and like the part of the point is, well, it's really hard to imagine what that's like. Mm-hmm. So, like, you're supposed to imagine this scenario and then have an intuition about it, but <laughs> it's hard for me to have an intuition about the scenario that I can't imagine. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if that's the case with like killing killing babies for fun. Like, ah, uh, no, maybe some maybe some Nazis had that. It... Well, <laughs> no. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't say they were killing people for fun. And also they, I, I, didn't, I didn't know if even the Nazis would have just killed babies. Uh, yeah. They would kill adults, um, but yeah. they wouldn't say that they were doing it for fun. So. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I was thinking of like Mengele or something, but he would say it's for science or something maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, like you could, you could take examples of psychopaths. But the thing is, like, it's not exact. It's not that they have the intuition that it's fine to kill other people. It's that they don't understand moral concepts. Right? Okay. At least that's that's what I think is happening. So it's not that they have a moral intuition that it's morally permissible. Yeah. Like they might say it's fine, but they don't mean it's morally permissible because they don't understand what morally permissible means. <laughs> because okay. they don't understand what morally wrong means. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay, so we we got pretty dark there for the for listener for those who are, who just came for uh, for the gun rights. Let's let's get into that. So we talked about uh, rights. We talked about uh, maybe just to clear things up. Uh, rights are you know you followed uh, uh, Frega in in his discourse view, but but ultimately, would you say that rights are grounded in or supervene on moral facts? I mean, they just are moral facts, right? Like, uh, um, there's a moral fact that you have a right to such and such. Okay. Well, then I don't, I'm not sure what the discourse is doing. If there's a moral, oh. yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, my point was sort of, I don't have to tell you what a right is. I have to tell you what the whole sentence, I have a right to X means. Okay. Right? And so like the word right might not be a referring expression. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sort of like how the average man is not, doesn't refer to anyone. <laughs> there's yeah. no object that's the average man but you can explain the whole sentence the average man is 2.1 children yeah right so maybe we can even you could maybe there's no such thing as like moral fact but there are moral facts um i guess well there's a category of moral facts i was confused by the first thing there's no such thing as moral facts in this well so I'm i'm trying to go with like the the right the rights stuff so like yeah um, there, cat, rights would be like a category of things, just like like moral facts would be a category of things. But there's, just as you oh. said, like there might not be like a moral right somewhere I can either grab or whatever. You wouldn't grab any of these, but yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just still I'm still wrestling with what? like the 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 connection between moral rights and moral facts. You're saying that moral rights are moral facts. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that you have a right, there is a fact that you have a right to life, for okay. example. Like, and what do I mean by that's a fact? Well, you have a right to life. Yeah. So it's true that you have a right to life. Okay. And it's not just, you know, it's not just my opinion. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. It's not just like, I don't like people murdering others. Like, yeah. No, really, it's wrong. Um. Okay. And, and we can, and so then you say, well, how do you know about that? And you go, well, we have, you going for ethical intuition ism that you have these these ethical intuitions 
Um, so that's like the epistemological question. Going back to like maybe to the like ontology, like what why is it wrong uh to kill me? Or why do I have a uh, at least prima facie right uh to liberty? Like what is it something about me? Oh, um I mean I you know one reading of that question is like uh why do I believe that? Or like what's the yeah. answer to that? And the answer to that is well, like you know, I have intuitive reactions to different scenarios and it turns out that almost everyone shares my reactions. So like you think about somebody just going down the street and just like killing somebody just for no particular reason. Uh, almost everyone, everyone except for psychopaths right, um, has the reaction that that's impermissible. So yeah, that just seems wrong. And, yeah. I, and then you might say, but you want a theoretical explanation for why that's wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so you know, a possible explanation is maybe maybe there's a rural utilitarian explanation. Okay. So like, so like, well, society works better if we have certain rules in general. Okay. Now you could like keep pushing it and say, well, why do we care about society working better? But that, or you know, what do you, what do you mean by society working better? Well, so right. like overall, there's going to be more utility. <laughs> yeah. Right. But this isn't a this isn't the traditional utilitarian view because on the traditional view, you don't, you don't have to appeal to general rules. You just do the individual act that maximizes utility. So I, um, like this might be right, but I don't have a lot of confidence in this, um, okay. this explanation. But then if you ask, oh, so, you know, why do we care about society working well in that sense? And I'd be like, well, this is just like a fundamental basic truth. Okay. Okay. So it's, as as fundamentally basic it's like unanalyzable it just it's a brute fact yeah you know okay. like harm is bad benefit is good <laughs> like, yeah you just see it or you don't <laughs> we should benefit more and harm fewer people <laughs> and so but is it is it something like it's something about the nature of persons right that, that like i have uh well i have a right to bear uh bear arms or own a gun but maybe my my dog doesn't have that right yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't know if your dog has the right. I mean, so like, I don't think that he's able. <laughs> like, I don't think that his paw can even pull the triggers. Man, some so. of the, some of these like Patriot Supply companies, man, I'm sure they're coming up with it right now. You know, get yeah. your dog a gun too. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you had this, you know, image of like the family where everybody has a gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was to, to the listeners. There's this. There's this funny meme that people say. Uh, people share. They say this is like how Europeans think of Americans. And it's a barbecue, yeah. and everyone, even the dog, has a gun, and they're like, yeah. they're like scooping up uh, brats and burgers with their guns, and that's, that's yeah. what we do in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, oh yeah, you know, like, oh, does it? Does somebody who's unable to do A have a right to do A? Well, first I have to figure out what that means. Okay. Like, does that mean that hypothetically, if they somehow did it, that you should let them do it? I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I guess if somehow a, a dog shows up and he like tries to buy a gun and like somehow he's able to carry it, I guess you should let him do it. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny. It actually, I don't, it, it's silly, right? But this is kind of what philosophy is like. If someone if someone did an experiment on a dog and and they were able to communicate in English, and maybe they had some kind of contraption for pulling and, and yeah, and they go to a gun store, does does the Second Amendment apply just to just to humans in America, or does it apply to any like thing that can uh, get to the level of being a, a person in America? Yeah, I mean, I would think that it would apply to you know, like it would apply to anyone who was able, right? Huh. Able to own a gun and use it and, okay. you know, didn't have any dis disqualifications. Like, you know, they weren't a murderer or other violent criminal or, you know, they weren't, they weren't crazy. Yeah. So, so that would, that could apply to like aliens, right? So aliens yeah. come here and I don't know the rules. I, maybe I should know that better. Like if you're on a green card, if you can own a gun or not, but like an alien becomes, Ah, if an alien becomes a U.S. citizen, then that seems like for sure they'd be able to own a gun because U.S. citizens can. Yeah. But see, now I'm not sure if we're talking about alien humans or. Oh, sorry, alien, alien, aliens from different planets. Yeah, sorry. Oh. 
Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I use like green space card. aliens. Space aliens. There we go. Yeah. Space alien yeah. shows up, and it's like, do they have a right to bear arms in yeah. our country? Yeah, or is that so just for humans. Yeah, yeah and so th like this is why they have the right to bear arms because they have lives. Presumably, they value their lives, and it's wrong to kill them. And if you have a right to something, then you have the right to defend it. If somebody tries okay. to violate your rights, then you have the right to take forceful action to stop that from happening. Having the right to defend your rights entails uh, having the right to possess effective means of doing so. Yeah. So this could apply to like an ostrich as well. Like this ostrich has this right. Yeah, it seems right. Unless some, I don't know, if someone soups up ostriches and gives them like laser beams on their head, it's like to, to help them, you know, to maybe neutral out the playing field. I don't know why I picked yeah. ostriches. Yeah, but I don't like, know what no, the I... ostriches natural enemies are. But... Yeah, cheetahs. Um, but if they, I'm thinking of like a, um, a PETA, a PETA scientist, someone who's, you know, really uh, well and uh, really a good engineer who is also a huge PETA fan. And they want to even out the playing field between humans and non-humans. And they're giving, you know, all sorts of animals different weapons. Yeah. To protect themselves. Do those animals have like a right to? I mean, they're alive. Do they have a right to bear those arms? Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know about that. Okay. You know, sometimes I'm tempted by a utilitarian view about non-human animals. Yeah. Like you know, just maximize utility or whatever. So then they wouldn't have rights per se. Okay. But it might be promoting utility. I, I don't know. It depends. Oh yeah, sure. Because you got to think about that. But then if if so, if you're you, if you do go in for that view, it seems like there's something special about human persons right yeah and um and you know why i mean yeah. you know again first i would say well like there's just intuitions <laughs> like yeah so i there are pretty strong deontological intuitions that um are just very widespread when you give these examples involving humans and i take it that they're just there just aren't such strong intuitions when you give examples using non-human animals so yeah um there is a non-human animal that's healthy but you could kill it and take its organs and save five other animals, right? Yeah, like, yeah. you know, there's one dog that you could, if you kill it, you can save five dogs' lives. Is that wrong? Um, I get, and I just have like a much less strong reaction to that. Yeah. And now you could ask, well, what's the theoretical explanation? So I, I don't know. That's a lot less clear. Yeah. Um, but you know, like if when I when I entertain, sometimes I entertain rule utilitarianism as possibly like whatever explaining explaining our intuitions. So, um, well, there are different consequences of having rules depending upon like whether you're talking about intelligent beings, you can understand those rules or not. Yeah. So, um, like people will so in the version of rule utilitarianism, I think is most plausible. Um, appeals to the effects of a rule being the socially accepted morality. Mm. Like there, there could be a socially accepted moral code in a society and you're supposed to think about what would be the best socially accepted moral code. Okay. And then, and it's just that um, there are different effects of rules depending upon, you know, whether they're applying to people or non-human animals, yeah. partly because the intelligent beings will understand the rules and then they will modify their behavior in reaction to that. Yeah. And so like, um, like this is an example I think I gave in a blog post, you know, like, okay, organ harvesting. What if there was a rule that uh, doctors, um, if you have, if you're healthy, doctors can just like come and kill you and take your organs um, if that would save other people's lives. And so like, here's a thing that you could imagine people doing. You could imagine people deliberately sabotaging their bodies so that if they're oh, killed, yeah. all their organs are destroyed. Yeah. And then, and they would have to somehow publicize that they had done this. Uh -huh. And so people would do this so they wouldn't be killed. Right. <laughs> to get their organs. And so, but now you realize that that's not a better situation. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, but animals wouldn't do that. If, if there was a socially accepted morality that you get to kill an animal to take its organs, animals would not do anything to try to sabotage that. Right. I mean, we have that now with deer hunters. Like there's, there's a, like eating liver is, is like a, a big trend right now. And so there's literally like the people want those organs. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. Um, 
Okay, that's helpful. Let me let me let me like full dive in on gun rights for all the gun toting Americans listening who are who yeah. are sad that we haven't got to it yet. So yeah. we, I mean, the Second Amendment, a well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And in your in your blog post in your uh, Substack article, you say you know I'm, I'm talking about the right to own a gun. And that's it. Not not whether to use it or not. Like this is this is this is what we have in mind. Just the right to own it. So uh, I'll just ask you: Do we have a right to own a gun? Yes. Yeah. That was easy. Yeah. <laughs> Podcast over. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. What is that? Oh, I I want to talk about like the theoretical uh, explanation there too. But like the we can go with both, right? So like why why do you think that we have that right? I guess. Yeah, I mean, the you know, the theoretical explanation in in brief terms is, well, if you have rights, then you have the right to defend those rights. Okay. And I think that's kind of implied in the idea of a right that you could you can use force to stop people from violating them. Yeah. And then I think that that suggests that you have the right to possess effective means of defending them. Mm -hmm. And it's a just an empirical fact that in our society, um, a gun is the most effective means of protecting yourself against violent criminals, right? And it's a fact that there are violent criminals in our society. And as a matter of fact, um, the police are very frequently not effectively protecting people from them. And there's like, and there's not, you know, a, f a feasible future in which everybody is effectively protected by the police. Yeah. Um, when it comes to effective means, I'm, I'm thinking like, what about like a dynamite vest? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no one come near me i have a dynamite vest and if everyone wore dynam well i guess if you're going for like the utilitarian view that might not be a better society well, you know there was a um um there's a book called snow crash by neil stevenson okay. where there's a there's a character who um he's he drives around with a small nuclear bomb <laughs> and uh and he's got like the bomb connected to him such that if his heart ever stops beating, the bomb will explode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's his method of self-defense. Right? Yeah. And because everyone knows that he has this bomb, like nobody will attack him. Yeah. So, that's pretty that, good. I, I was going to go to nuke later. Yeah, that's yeah. that's great. That's an effective means of self-defense. So, um, yeah. So, you know, do you have the right to possess any and every effective means? So, no. Okay. Right? Like. You know, he could own a gun and that would be effective without providing as much threat to everyone else, right? Yeah. It's like, what if he just has a heart attack? Then he destroys the city, you <laughs> yeah, know? Right. Like, well, you can't do that. Okay. So um, the the right in the Second Amendment is about, um, it's about bearing arms. Yeah. And that's because that's what they had then. They had, they had guns. Yeah. Uh, I'm not trying to make like the musket argument or anything. I'm just thinking like... <laughs> If they had, like musket. <laughs> yeah, if they had like laser guns, would that be, would that be different? Because like, did they just grab what they had and they said, this is the weapon of choice? Like if they wrote it 200 years yeah. before, would they have said swords and limited it to that? Or if they said it, if they wrote yeah. it, you know, 300 years well, from now, would they say laser guns? Um, I mean, they would, they would have said, like, I take it that arms refers to weapons in general. So okay. they would have just said arms. Now, so they knew that there was such a thing as technological advancement. Sure. Yeah. Like they couldn't, so because they'd seen technological advancement. If you went like really long ago, maybe they would have not known that there was going to be advancement. But right. they surely knew that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So you know, you might want to ask. Well, but is there some limit to like how advanced a weapon that you can, you can have? Right. Um, and then you know, like what most um, pro gun people say, which you know seems reasonable to me, is. Um, the weapons that we issue to rank and file soldiers in our military, like we ordinary citizens should be able to have that kind of weapon. Yeah. So if there's a weapon that you think is too dangerous, like you, if you think it's too dangerous for, for me to own, it must be too dangerous for just all the average soldiers to own. Right. Huh? Right. Which is, which is true about nuclear weapons Like you would not give a single soldier control of a nuke. Yeah, that's true. Like you wouldn't like it would never be that there's a single person who can launch a nuclear missile. What about a what about a tank? I I, I don't have the same like uh, yeah intuition about that. I could see most of the I don't know infantry or whoever like being cool with a tank. Yeah, 
Uh, you know, I'm I'm okay with people owning tanks. Okay. <laughs> like, by the way, I mean, you know, they're pretty expensive. <laughs> so yeah, right. If right. you're maybe like a few billionaires, right? Basically, only billionaires would own them. This is so why like we need positive rights. This yeah. is why we need. I have a right to a tank. Buy yeah. me a tank. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, like, yeah, if Elon Musk was driving around in a tank, that would be fine with me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now you know, like, if it gets to be a problem, then we could reconsider it, <laughs> right? But right, like right now, I just don't foresee there being like a big problem with of people, you know, too many tanks driving around, yeah, <laughs> blowing up buildings. Well, so that's that's a point that I wanted to kind of uh, flesh out a little bit more. Whether like the the practical implications, and then like the the actual like rights and moral implications like maybe maybe you have a right to weapons that aren't very practical to have and so like yeah maybe practically but maybe practically you won't you won't own them or i don't know even like you shouldn't if you're if you're wise but you do have the right to that thing and i'm wondering like if the practical implications actually affect the more the morality of it the actual right itself yeah, so um, you have a prima facie right to do anything that you want, regardless of um, the consequences. But it, your prima facie right might be our way because it's not absolute. So yeah, so yeah, no, you have a prima facie right to own a nuclear weapon, right? <laughs> as long as you're yeah. not hurting anyone else with it, you know. But that is outweighed by the risk of destroying the entire city that you live in, right? Yeah. Um, yeah um does that so it would be more risky for me hmm, let me think let's say that i could develop a nuclear weapon but i'm like kind of a bad engineer i kind of have a bad track record of being negligent and stuff yeah. but you have a really good track record and you're super competent with uh nuclear fusion and fission and all sorts of stuff would it, so it, it seems like in this case i want to give it's more risky for me to have it than you do you have more of a right to own a nuke than I do? Well, I mean, I guess we have the same right, but there's more there's more reason against it in your case because there's more risk, right? Okay. I mean, like, but you know, basically in both cases, our right is outweighed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So you know, you might think, oh, but like humor is super careful, so like he would never have an accident. Yeah. Sure, but. The rest of society can't know for sure that I'm not going to, like, that I'm not a terrorist or whatever. By the way, if somebody's trying to build a nuclear bomb, come on, they're a terrorist. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what else do you need a nuclear bomb for? Yeah. Well, I, I, I was just thinking, like, the the deterrent of, like, I have a nuke, dude. Like, don't mess yeah, with don't me. Mess with me. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I mean, like, there's no. Um, there's no acceptable self-defense scenario in which you actually use it, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, um, what what about like a what about like a laser gun that that you know sci-fi like shoots out lasers? Like it's a it's an arm. It seems like we still have the right to bear it, even if it's like super devastating and effective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so some people sometimes ask, uh, oh, like what about owning machine guns? Because yeah, right. Well, um, ex extra deadly, right? Um, and you know, and why would anyone have that? Because, like, you know, just a handgun is enough, right? Ordinary, um, lead shooting handgun, not a laser gun, is enough to defend yeah. yourself. And so, like, basically, the only reason you would need the bigger things would be to defend against the government, yeah. Um, but you know, basically, like, I think if, um, if the government soldiers had laser guns, then uh, the population should be able to have them too, okay. Right. But, you know, but that does depend upon like, you know, going beyond the protection from crime argument and going to the protection from the government argument. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I meant to ask you about that as well. Um, sometimes like uh, popular thinkers like like Ben Shapiro will say, you know, look, this this was always about protecting against tyranny, against a, a, a tyrannical government coming at you. And I wondered if that was even necessary, if it's just protection in general, like from anyone. Yeah, including government, but it, it doesn't have to be rooted in protecting yourself from a tyrannical government. It seems like it's just protect. You have rights, and therefore you have, like you said, the right to protect your rights. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have a right to defend yourself against anyone who would violate your rights. 
uh, including the government as well as private criminals. Now today, like, well, most of the time, the threat is from private criminals. Yes. Yeah. Whatever we have, you know, some whatever over 10,000 murders per year and you know tens of thousands of other violent crimes yeah um but you know as to what the founders were thinking i mean they were probably more worried about the government i mean um actually, i mean there's three there are three people to worry about or whatever three groups there's private criminals there's your own government and then there's foreign governments oh yeah sure and the last one is neglected, but um, I think that was actually a big concern for the founders, right? Yeah. So that's why they said that thing about the well-regulated militia. So right? that we could all stay strapped and the whole country would be, yeah, scary to mess with. Yeah, right? No, Nobody's going to invade America. Right. And by the way, I think this is actually true today. Like one reason why another country would not invade America, besides the huge military. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. But also in addition to that, if they somehow defeat the military, you know, try occupying this country where there's more guns than any other country in the world. Right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> does does that third category of other countries does that include uh, foreign worlds countries? Would would aliens fall into that oh. as well? <laughs> uh, I guess. So the you know the risk of alien invasion is uh, smaller. Let's say. <laughs> yeah. Risk of human let's hope. Invasion. Yeah. Um, and also, like, you know, it would be harder to defend against that. If there actually were space aliens and they actually invaded, um, you know, we would just lose immediately. I mean, it's like, you know, because, right, because any civilization that has interstellar space travel, they are probably thousands of years more advanced than us. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. But, but we got... Uh... We got Jim Bob down the street with his his own personal arsenal, man. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the 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 only way that we might have a chance is we might steal some of their technology. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so aliens. That's a that's a that's a fascinating one. That's a great topic. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I wonder. Um, <clears throat> uh, just in in talking with you here. I wanted to run something by you. So it seems like, so we have, we have prima facie rights. Is the right to defend our rights? Is that a meadow right? Is that like, I could see someone arguing and I kind of want it myself, but I'm not very good at this saying like the right to defend your rights is absolute. Even if those rights themselves are prima facie. What, what do you think about that? Just intuitively. Oh, I mean, I, I don't know why that one would be absolute if none of the others are. Um, so, I mean, you know, okay, you could think about the reasons why we don't, or why I don't accept absolute rights in general, right? Yeah. So there's the risk argument. So, you know, you could just apply that. So, okay, so like a violation of the right of self-defense would be like taking everybody's guns away. Yeah. Just preventing them from defending themselves. Um, is that absolute? Well, what if like taking, what if taking your gun away would somehow prevent World War Three? Is it okay to take your gun away? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it is. Can, can can it be can it be okay, <clears throat> like a morally permissible action, and yet we can still acknowledge that I have a right to own that? So, like my right didn't like get dissolved, right? It's yeah. doesn't it just like no? It's permissible for me to do this, even though I acknowledge like he has a right to defend himself. So if I shot at you, you wouldn't be like, oh, how could you shoot at me defending yourself? You're like, yeah, you have that right, but we're gonna violate it. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, so what happens when a right is outweighed by utilitarian considerations is not that you don't have the right anymore, but what happens is that there's just a justified rights violation. Yeah. Okay, but um, you know that's true of uh, you know, just all different kinds of rights. So okay, you know, like when you when we took the blood away from the one person who didn't want to give it to save um, you know, whatever to cure cancer, <laughs> yeah. it was still a, it was still a rights violation, but it was a justified okay. rights violation. Okay. So then. So yeah, okay. You were saying that the the problem with the absolute rights is like you can't ever move ever because of the risk. Because right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you do anything, there's a risk, and yeah. you know, like if you have any absolute right, I think that just by me living, I might risk infringing upon it. Whatever it is, <laughs> I might accidentally stop someone from defending themselves sometimes. So yeah. Man, so this stuff is scary thinking about like AI programs because that's like when Ultran takes over the world. If I accidentally typed in that I have an 
absolute right to self protection and yeah. ultron is like all right well then i have to kill everyone because that's the implications of having this absolute right <laughs> for parker that's scary <laughs> right yeah man okay um <clears throat> so we have a, a right to to own a gun uh how about like like using that like are there are there different circumstances under which I'm sure the answer is yes, under which it would be more or less justified, but like protecting your property um, against trespass. Can you use the gun? Like, should you like shoot a warning shot first or can you directly shoot someone? What, what do you make of those kind of? Yeah, I mean, there's well, so like, you know, philosophers can have interesting, difficult theoretical cases, yeah. uh, but then, you know, then um we could think about like practical realistic cases yeah. which might be less whatever less theoretically interesting so that, right so like the real world cases are like somebody breaks into your house at night and you don't know what they're there for yeah so it could just be a burglar it could be that they thought you weren't home and they wanted to take your vcr it could be somebody who is just making a mistake and <laughs> whatever yeah like it's a drunk person who thinks that this is their house and they don't understand why they their key wasn't won't work on their house but <laughs> whatever they try right. to break in um but you don't know that so you know they could also be there to murder you right so like somebody's breaking into your house like um yeah i mean like you know maybe the smartest thing is to to tell to say i have a gun you know get out yeah and call yeah. the police uh, but if they keep coming, then maybe maybe you have to shoot them. Yeah. So, like br the breaking into the house seems more clear cut to me, and it would make sense. But if it, if someone's like on your property and you're like, "Hey, get off my property! I have a gun," and that person like, I, mean, I don't know, they were publicly hunting and they accidentally came on your property and they don't know, maybe they think you're a tweaker or whatever. Like, uh, can you just shoot them if they're on your property? You think? Oh, uh, that doesn't sound right. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it does either. I didn't do a good job of motivating it. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like, so, like, you just own some large area yeah. out, out in the woods or something, and, like, there's some some hunter who's trespassing or something. Can you just shoot them? Yeah, that doesn't doesn't sound, that sounds disproportionate. So, so the, yeah, that's the question is, like, the proportionate action uh, of defense and knowing it's like justified based on your knowledge. Like in the, in the case you were uh, just mentioning, if someone breaks in, like you don't, you don't know if you knew prior to that it was drunk guy breaking in, like you would not be justified in taking lethal action. But if you didn't know, then you're, then you're justified. Yeah. So if you didn't know if this hunter was like, uh, occupy, like, uh, I don't know, North Korean, <laughs> like <laughs> red dawn type thing, then you don't know. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of that's that's fascinating that like the knowledge comes in. Um, I wanted uh, any any thoughts on that before I, I have one more question that I wanted to. No, well, I, I know, yeah, like so, like if we were actually in a situation where invasion was likely, then maybe you shoot before saying anything because you don't want to give them a chance to respond. Right. But in the yeah. in our actual situation, like there's no there's no realistic chance that we're being invaded. Yeah. This is man, like practical. We're like getting into like applied ethics territory type stuff, I think. And it's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of the listener. So I agree with you so much on this. So it's, it's tough, but I'm thinking of the listener who is more uh, pro gun control type stuff. And they're saying, well, look, maybe I even go with you. I agree with prima facie right rights to, uh, to bear arms, but that those are outweighed by just the uh, general safety concerns like this, this country would be better if there were no guns, even if that's an infringement on everyone's personal rights to bear arms. What, what do you make of that type of argument? Or yeah, I mean, yeah. well, you know, like the meaning of rights is that uh, you can't violate somebody's rights, you know, to to produce slightly or moderately better consequences. Okay. Um, you could violate somebody's rights to produce vastly better consequences. But I basically think there's no argument for gun control producing vastly better consequences. Um, as a matter of fact, um, like the case for it producing benefits, overall benefits at all, is really weak. Okay. And you know, like that. I mean, the um, 
biggest mistake that people make is confusing uh, having a law that says you don't do X with having nobody do X. Yeah. <laughs> you have a law that says nobody can own a gun. That is very different from having a society in which nobody owns a gun. All right. Rather, and you know, we see this with, uh, for example, the drug war. So, like, you know, most left-leaning people can understand this example. There's a yeah. big difference between having a law that nobody uses recreational drugs and actually having there not be any recreational drug use. Instead, right. you know, what we have is a huge black market, which strengthens yeah. organized crime. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, in the case of guns, you know, there's like there are more guns than people in the country. You know, mm -hmm. there's like hundreds of millions of guns in the country. Okay, so you know tomorrow, and and by the way, there's lots of people who love guns and think, you know, that there's nothing wrong with owning them. That it's great to own them. Actually, there are yeah. people who think it's praiseworthy. So, right. okay, the government passes a law tomorrow saying nobody can own a gun, and what do you think happens? Well, there's going to be a huge black market. You know, we're not giving up our guns, yeah. and you know, like a lot of just ordinary law-abiding citizens will probably at that point decide that they're no longer law abiding because, okay, right. some, some will give up their guns, but the ones who will, will be the ones who you actually didn't want to give up their guns. Right. It's like, if you're so law abiding that you give up your gun, then, well, you weren't going to commit crimes with it anyway. Yeah. Okay, then the criminals, they hear about this law. They're like, you know, I was going to go out and murder some people, but you know, I just found out that I'm not allowed to have a gun. I better turn it in. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, right. No. So, like, it's still going to be pretty easy for the criminals to get guns. It's yeah. just, it's just going to be that the most law-abiding people don't have them, and that's like so. That just makes things worse. It might be true that the world in which nobody has a gun at all is better. Right. right? But the world in which the criminals have them and the non-criminals don't is worse. Yeah. So yeah, getting into like the, the, the practical implications. Now you have to make, you have to make arguments and, and say, well, this is why it would or wouldn't be better. And like, think about what that would do to our society to outlaw guns and, and how, how many, how many law abiding citizens today would then either be criminals or be locked up or so all those things, but in just the purely theoretical, do they have a point that like, um, if there were no guns, you could magically wish it or something like that, make this law and all the guns would be gone. Would would that be a better world or or worse world? Yeah, it's think? hard to say, right? So like so left leaning people usually assume that it would be better, but I think they're not taking into account certain things. So <clears throat> yeah. the world in which there are no guns is the world in which um the strongest rule, right? Yeah. So uh like you know, cr most criminals can still commit their crimes. Right because most criminals are stronger than their victims and larger and they can have other weapons too and um you know they could have weapons that require strength or skill to use yeah. like knives and then and then their victim will not so like like it's far from obvious right um, yeah you know women in particular um other women are less likely to own guns they're the ones who are more likely to need it yeah, it's a great equal. It's a great feminist tool of equality, uh, yeah. because it, it equals the playing field. And I don't, I don't, I do that to trigger people a little bit, but it's it's actually a, a really good point that yeah. I hear from gun advocates. Yeah, no, that, that's why they call the Colt uh, six shooter the equalizer, right? There's oh, is like that a, okay? Yeah, there's like a there's a saying that people have that the gun people have that you know God made man and women and Sam Colt made them equal. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the criminals have all the time in the world to get good at their skills. Where, where law-abiding citizens are out doing their work, they're doing jobs. They don't have time to practice with the knives all day. Yeah, but the criminals can, like, and they can just yeah, go rob they, you. Like the criminals will just tend to be just more aggressive people. Yeah, and uh, and also they will just pick a victim who looks weaker. So right. they're not going to they're not going to attack somebody who looks big and strong. So yeah, <laughs> that's. Every, yeah, so everyone needs to get a gun and and actively train in jujitsu is what you're saying. That's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't know if we totally satisfied all the gun nuts and stuff, but the the prima facie versus absolute rights that that's a new one for me, and and I, you've made me think about so much stuff here that I have to go chew on, and now I have a bunch of homework. So thanks yeah. for that. But um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this has been this has been actually like super super helpful for me to get motivated to start studying meta ethics and 
even political philosophy, it's it's just it's confirmed a lot of the kind of tricky morass that I thought ethics was. And I think I still think it's here. I think it's it's tricky. Um, what would be a good place for people to start in on ethical theory and and uh, meta ethics? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I have this really great book called Ethical Intuitionism by yeah. me. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Right. Yeah. But also, wait, I have some other good books. Uh, yeah. Here's a great book on political philosophy. It's the problem of yeah. political authority. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's why you were asking. So I could. No, I was. It was absolutely what I was asking. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and I, I, I definitely want to talk more about the, the um, political authority stuff with you sometime. It's it's great because you got your wealth of, of topics, uh, which you've mastered. You're, you're an expert in. So that's really great. Um, Man, thanks so much for for all your time here. Thanks for for helping me think through this stuff. Again, like I said, it's tricky, and I have to go think about this more. Ah, man. But um, can can you tell the listeners like where they can find? They can buy your books here, but they can also read your stuff other places. Where where can they find your work at? Oh yeah, so people should read my blog. Yeah. Fake news. Substack. Net. Fake news is spelled F A K E N O U S. Yeah. It's One okay. word. Yeah. Um. All right. Awesome. I'll put the link in the description here. Um, that's going to have to do it for now, folks. Um, I hope you're not too triggered by this, but if you are, drop a comment. What do you think? Was it convincing? Do you think, are you an absolutist about rights or did, did uh, Dr. Humor convince you like he's he's done to me? Um, all right. Well, yeah, we want to hear from you. Uh, drop a comment in the description. That's going to have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. <laughs>